Hello, hello, hello. Hola, hola, hola. Hola, hola, hola. Hola, hola. Ah, excelente. Ah, muy bien. Bueno, eh. Uh -huh. Ahí estamos. Hola, estoy reinis. Ah, oh, uh, sorry, the language. I'm, I'm getting sidetracked here. So, welcome back. Uh, this is the beginning of a new season, if you will, for this live stream about modern computer stuff, uh, biochemistry, immunobiology, you name it. Most of the things I'm going to show you are useful for very specific questions but that doesn't mean that they cannot be used for answering any other questions i'm going to start with the simplest yet sometimes most misunderstood aspect of this modeling and i'm focusing on on structural modeling this doesn't have to be numerical in in any regard so i'm going to start in fact i'm going to start up a little bit <laughs> further back. When digging, when, when starting with a new protein, I am very conscious of the fact that I may not know enough about that protein to actually design useful experiments. So what I usually do is what I usually do, sorry, adjusting the microphone levels, what I usually do is visit the website you can see over here, uh -huh, the Uniprot. The Uniprot, you may already know, is, as you can read over here, a database for proteins, for sequence, for structure, for all the information you can imagine that is relevant to understanding a protein or several proteins. Let's uh, take a quick look. Well, in fact, since I have the search, the search results from Google over here, you can look and I encourage you to do the same in your, in your browser, look it up and you can see that it mentions that it's going to have information in FASTA, which is a general format for sequences for protein sequences, that is amino acids, and extensive markup language, XML, which is a, a very fancy language that can be parsed by computers. So whereas the FASTA is easily visualized by humans, XML is not so much. So I'm going to go and give you a quick tour. Usually in my biochemistry classes, I use either myoglobin or uh, hemoglobin as an example but of course this is going to work for many proteins as any database or even a library if you will they are not complete and they are not perfect this database is going to give you a couple of items that I'm going to emphasize throughout the hour that can help you identify which pieces of information are reliable and which other pieces of information might be not entirely complete or unreliably so. So, so as I said, mm, let's, uh, let's start up with myoglobin. <coughs> one of the most interesting aspects of this database, one that I, I like a lot, is that it's not that much different from Google. What am I talking about? Well, that, as I want to show you up there in the search bar, you can actually look up uh, several pieces of information as if they were logical operators. Why do I mean by logical operators? Well, that these operators or these um, searches can be done in such a way that you get the par exact parameters that you want. Uh, 
sorry for that trying to change this okay so now if I point there it looks okay good so over here is the search bar it starts up with the uniprot which is the protein knowledge base you can look for uniref which are sequence clusters and that's very useful if you're looking for homologs or a whole family or the representatives of families the sequence archive proteomes that is protein sets from fully fully sequenced genomes and of course the help notice I, i'm not going to go through those but if you have the time and i encourage you to take the time the those um help pages and frequently asked questions and so forth they are very explicit they are very helpful to understand how this database works this knowledge base works and it includes videos so you need anything else that i'm not going to cover or that is very specific goes way beyond what i'm showing here <coughs> that is a place to go <coughs> as any good database or knowledge base is supposed to be there's literature cit citations, so you can go to the papers where something was defined. For example, I'm thinking glycosylations or uh, post-translational modifications. That is the place where you can find it. Taxonomy, keywords, subcellular locations. You, you can find pretty much, pretty much everything you need here as long as you have a general idea of what you're looking for, right? This is not exactly a wiki, so even though the information is organized in more or less the same fashion throughout the database or the knowledge base, if you don't have basic knowledge of cellular biology, biochemistry, and even genetics, some of this information might be uh, not easy to grasp, not on your own. So I'm assuming that to begin with, guys. If you know cellular biology, biochemistry, and uh, genetics, the basics, like undergrad level, this is going to be cool. So I'm going to stick to the Uniprot and I'm going to do something that I always recommend to newbies, to the people that start using this database, is that don't look up only a protein or don't think of a protein as such, but think about the species or maybe even think about the function. So to begin with, because uh, I'm anthropocentric as everybody else, I'm going to type homo sapiens as one of the parameters of my search so what this is doing with my search is that it's restricting whatever result i can get to proteins from homo sapiens of course you could be interested in proteins from a parasite from a virus all of them can be found here but then you should restrict the queries so for example influenza or, for example, let me think of a parasite. Well, I, I cannot think of one right now. So let's stick with Homo sapiens. And as I said, these searches are not that much different from Google. You can add in capital letters a, a uh, logical operator. And you can see the different ands that it's understanding. So the operator. That's fine. I'm going to erase the second one. We don't need that. And then the name or the, of the protein or, or maybe even the function. Let's try oxygen carrier. Let's assume I know that there's several oxygen carriers that are not hemoglobin or myoglobin. So I'm going to look for all of them. And all of them that are also human. So this is one of the results. As you can see, the organization is rather different from Google. Straight away, we have this box that tells us Uniprot knowledge base, that's the KB, consists of two sections. The reviewed one, which is a manually annotated, manually meaning a human being read this and, and check that these notes were relevant. And it's explicit here, record, records with, the, with information extracted from literature and curator evaluated computational analysis. So there's computers doing some of this, but somebody, a human is checking it. But then, then, then there is the unreviewed, computationally analyzed only. One is also called Swissprot and the other is called Tremble. 
Over here, you can see, as I mentioned before, the help, uni, prod, KB, help videos, tutorials and videos, and of course, downloads. Downloads, some in some cases, or actually most instances, usually are like the whole data sets. You can download all the Swiss prod, all the Tremble, and many variations thereof. For the time being, I'm going to close that one. Well, actually, I should leave it like that, just in case we need to talk about it. The basket, I'm going to talk about that later, and I'm going to move down here. So Uniprod KB is these two mm, sections. And over here in those column, before looking at the result, by this column, you can see that we can filter the results we already have. We could only look at the proteins that belong to the reviewed section or look at the proteins that belong only to the unreviewed section. As it is now, um, you can see here that we have 180 results and on this, uh, on this window, we are only looking at, sorry, we're looking at both reviewed and unreviewed Section. So I'm going to expand the show limit to 250. And I'm going to scroll down so you can see that, in fact, there's a list or a set of reviewed proteins, and then there is the unreviewed. Let me, let me make a notice of something that is very important. Sometimes, let's say, for example, the sequences of influenza viruses, different strains, because, you know, there's different strains and different look, identify in different places of the world. Those mostly fall in the unreviewed one. And another thing that's worth noticing, like the opposite of the case of the influenza, which the whole virus is deposited in the unreviewed section, is that proteins, some proteins in the unreviewed sections are incomplete. It's either fragments or uh, maybe even variations that weren't sequenced to its entirety, to their entirety. So sometimes we may not find what we're looking for in the reviewed version, but now we have to evaluate the unreviewed uh, one case at a time to make sure that they are what we need and that uh, it's relevant to what we are interested in. We can also filter by organisms, authors, disease, ontologies, families, etc. This is going to vary depending on the protein we are looking at and from here we can also jump to the reference section of the of the uniprot that is if we want just a specific proteins by ontology uh, or enzyme class or pathways for example glycolysis and such so what i usually do well we know what we're looking for we can look at the entries for example these columns they describe a code that belongs oh they have tooltips so if you put your mouse over the names of the columns it's going to give you this information for example unique and stable entry identifier so the numbers well the letters and numbers in this column are unique identifiers for any of these proteins so much so i'm going to just copy and paste this one and as you can see using that code gives you in google the first result being exactly the same protein with the same code on the Uniprot, in the NCBI, on the RCSV. So in the Uniprot knowledge base, on the NCBI, which also can be uh, colloquially called GymBank, and on the protein structure database. So this code, if you don't remember, you don't memorize <coughs> anything about your protein, except one piece of information, let it be this code, because that's going to help you always find the same sequence, the same structure that you were using and that you are interested in. Then we have a entry name, which is usually related to the species and to the gene that, that we're talking about. This icon that represents the, the reviewed section the protein name and gene names when there's variations of the gene name they are displayed accordingly as you can see in this case and the species 
because we look for humans, it's going to be very unlikely that anything other than human is shown here. Sometimes for parasites, you can get uh, proteins that are not synthesized, that are not coded in the human genome, but are associated to humans because they are the humans are the host. And the last default column, at least I think it's the default column, is the length. And that length, its manifest is depicted as residues. So, for example, this, oh, notice this icon over here. This means that if I click there, it's going to make the column wider so I can read the content. So we have a calcium binding mitochondrial carrier protein, RLR1, which is at 678 protein, or residue long protein. The calcium, uh, a similar protein number two, has a few more less residues and so on. Notice that uh, at least from a point of view of somebody that doesn't know a lot about these proteins, it's easier to recognize hemoglobin subunit gamma, sub hemoglobin subunit delta, cytochrome C, hemoglobin subunit beta, and hemoglobin subunit alpha. There's other proteins uh, uh, that probably are related to oxygen transport, maybe indirectly, but they are here. Uh, here we have myoglobin, for example. Let me go back up. Here we are again. Because I found hemoglobins and myoglobins in the review section, and even this neuroglobin, which I hope is related to hemoglobin, we can make the decision of restricting our search or the use of sequences to this section, only the reviews. It doesn't contain tons of sequences, but that's fine. We don't need tons of sequences. We want the sequences with the highest quality. And these are at least reviewed and backed up by literature. And that's pretty important. Notice that all of the columns have these arrows, which are there to allow me to sort them alphabetically or incrementally. For example, e I could request this column to be sorted by the length of the protein. If I click on the downward arrow, what I will get as soon as the, as soon as the uh, connection is refreshed, Oh, one second for it. There we go. We get the longest sequences on top and the shortest in the bottom. We could press the downward arrow again and we will get the reverse. We will get the shortest proteins on top and the longest in the bottom. If we had more organisms than Homo sapiens, if I were to click the downward arrow in the organism column, I should get to see which is the other, or what are the other species, the latest in terms of the sequence, uh, sorry, in the name of the protein, but here it's going to give us exactly the same both ways. The names can be sorted alphabetically, the entries alphanumerically, and the entry names too. So that will be, that will be useful in case you are looking for something that you have a general idea of where it will be in terms of the alphanumerical indexes that you can sort. Let's see. Okay, so before jumping into further details, I want to stop for a second and, and, well, throw the question to you, the audience. At this point, we have only made searches. We can probably, and as you can see over here in the search bar, make very complex searches for different aspects of a protein set of characteristics. For example, intracellular, extracellular, when there's proteins that exist as mitochondrial copies, as cytoplasmic copies, who know, maybe even secretion, secretion proteins, uh, all variations could be handled over here. The search 
The search results as they are in these columns are usually useful when you're looking not only for one protein, but maybe for a family. What you want is to take a look at all of the proteins that are there available and e within the within the f space of your search if that makes sense that is you could request all of cal all of the calcium binding mitochondrial proteins but also as a separate set all the calcium binding carriers that are not mitochondrial so instead of having an and here I, I am going to do it right away. I'm going to flip it and ask and not review it. So this search query should show me exactly the same results, but now only composed by the proteins that are not reviewed or unreviewed for that matter. And this could be as useful because I, will, I could ask myself the question, why do we have another myoglobin here? Why do we have this list of myoglobins? Some of the answers might be as simple as, well, this might be variations, variants, mutations that haven't been sequenced completely, that have been reported, but are still uh, not completely sequenced or not completely, or not sequenced to the satisfaction of good or high standards. Sometimes having a good list of search terms can save you lots of time so I recommend uh, you take the time when you are doing these searches to think beforehand on oh, sorry, on what you are looking for. Sorry, I need to correct a tweet. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. So, now that we have good results, let me show you another characteristic. I'm gonna sort the, pro the protein names in the other direction, that is from the first letters in the alphabet to the latest, and I'll show you the operation of this basket button over here. So let's assume that we know that we wanna use cytochrome C, which is a globin, and it has a heme group as hemoglobin, all the hemoglobin subunits identified in the database, and notice what I'm doing because I am so used to this. The first column that I didn't, didn't even mention is a checkbox. You can check all of the sequences, or you can check each one, one by one. So as I'm doing right now, cytochrome C, all the hemoglobins, all of them, uh, and as I said, you can see we have alpha, beta, which is the adult version, well, which are going to be part of the adult hetero tetramer, delta, epsilon, gamma 1, gamma 2, mu, theta, and zeta. And I don't remember precisely which or which subunits are expressed in early embryonic development and before being born, so you will get different uh, hetero tetramers in the well, in any living being. Oh, just a second. And of course, because we are talking about hemoglobins, I'm going to get myoglobin. And just for good measure, this neuroglobin. Just by looking at the sequences, we can see that in general, hemoglobins are more or less the same length. Myoglobin is slightly longer, as well as this neuroglobin. And cytochrome C is significantly, significantly smaller, 105 residues versus 150. I'm not draw going to draw any conclusions about that, but, but this is the power of just this search window, that you can start comparing these characteristics. Now, what is the usefulness of the basket, you say? Well, here I have a list of 12 sequences that are related to the oxygen carrier function and that are from Homo sapiens. And if I click here on add to basket, um, there we go. What you are gonna find is that now this basket, this little window contains all of those sequences 
and now I can sub process these ones to align, to map the IDs, to download the sequences. So this is actually pretty useful because and I'm going to do something that sometimes happens to me that I close the window and because I forgot what I was doing and I don't want to have the windows open any reason you can think of maybe even the browser crashed well because the basket has cookies in your computer what you have when you return to Uniprod is that you still have your basket full with your sequences and it's as easy as just clicking on the entry to visit just the precise sequence or click on all of them to further process the results such as in this case I can go to my basket and select the sequence alignment uh, button at the bottom of the window and there we go we have a sequence alignment for those sequences that I already painstakingly select and aligned in this very moment and here we go remember what I mentioned that cytochrome C was shorter than the others that can be seen right here there is a region of this cytochrome C that just create gaps because the sequence it doesn't align well but also it's shorter so there in order to align it as align it as best as possible a gaps appear there's another one here a tiny one here and of course being a protein of, of 42 residues less we have huge gaps in the sequence uh, if you haven't read a fast alignment before, let me uh, point out that these dashed lines indicate, indicate gaps in the sequence. Gaps in the sequence, but due to the alignment. This doesn't mean that the sequence is incomplete, that we don't know what's supposed to be here. No, it means that when these sequences, these complete review sequences were aligned, this gap had to be introduced to e get the best alignment possible. The letters, of course, are the single letter code for residues, for amino acids. We have one dot, which means weak homology. Spaces means no homology. Two dots are a strong homology. And these asterisks represent identity. That is, though these residues in this column, uh, well, I'm not going to select it, but the residues in this column are identical. These type of alignments are fairly easy to read by humans. It takes a while to get used to it. And in general, the hardest part about this is when you have really lots of sequences. Then they become slightly difficult to read. But as you can see on the left, we have these columns that permit us to highlight these sequences. For example, this information, where is there a helix structure, where is there supposed to be a modified residue, sequence conflict, binding sites, glycosylations for extracellular proteins, proteins, disulfide bonds, initiation methionine, beta strand sites, and whatnot. These are properties that are found in the annotation. Sometimes they are predicted, but more often than not, they come from, from work, experimental work. And down here we have amino acid properties. Similarity will be the most obvious to try. If you click on that one, you get to see these gray outlines, which show that the light gray are the ones with the lowest homology. This white, which is pretty much nothing, means no homology. The darker gray, a higher homology. And the darkest gray, identity. And now we have those residues highlighted. And you will notice that it will kind of seem that the cytochrome C is really far away from the sequences that maybe if we remove it, we will get a better alignment and we will do that. But let's cover a little bit more of these amino acid properties. If you click on hydrophobic, another set of patterns emerge, negative residues, the same, positive. So here you can select properties of residues and map them into this sequence alignment. N notice that whereas the amino acid properties are going to be selectable for all of the sequences, if we were to try and do that for the annotations, those are going to be dependent on the sequence 
being annotated for that property. Doesn't mean that they are not glycosylated, for example, just that in the annotation that information is not present. The annotations indicate there's no glycosylation. Remember too that hemoglobin gets glycated in the bloodstream through a process that is not mediated by enzymes. If people is uh, exhibiting a high glucose level most of the time in their life, hemoglobin will get glycated, which is the correct name for the chemical modification of a protein by a saccharide that doesn't happen because of cellular organelles or enzymatic activity. Down here, uh, using this information, a tree was drawn. Noting cytochrome C is, the, is one of the branches that is farther separated from the rest. So this kind of suggests what I said before, that maybe this protein is not that closely related and removing it will give us a better alignment. And in order to do that, here we have, or we should have, yes, edit and resubmit. So with this information now, we can go back and decide, for example, to manually remove the sequence of the cytochrome C from this alignment and redo it. And what I'm expecting is then that these hemoglobin proteins and the myoglobin are more closely related among themselves in such a way that now my alignment is going to show more conserved regions and with a higher homology. Well, let's see if my prediction pans out. Hey, uh, uh, guys, I hope you join frequently. I would like to see comments in the chat. I'm just covering this the best I can. But if you are online, you could text me and ask me to show very specific things that maybe I'm not showing. OK, here we go. We have the result. As you can see, the improvement wasn't that much. But now, instead of having regions with weak homology, we have a stronger homology and more identity. We still have a couple of gaps which is actually very interesting, tiny. The most uh, interesting will be in the middle, and those at the end are not that interesting. I'm going to highlight the similarity, and as you can see now, many more residues emerge that retain similarity across these proteins. Maybe it's because the specific function of oxygen binding that this histidine is highlighted as highly conserved. And I'm pretty sure that if we were to look, this histidine is one of those involved in the coordination of the iron by the heme, uh, by the heme group. And I've, I, in fact, we should try that. Let's see. Let's combine similarity with binding site. OK, so this histidine is binding site, this lysine, and this one. But it doesn't show ours. Oh, metal binding. That's even better. So according to, to the annotations, the metal binding residue, one of the metal binding residues is precisely that histidine that I already highlighted because of its identity. The other one has a low identity just because this one didn't align well. This could be an artifact of the alignment because we know Oh, sorry, no, this is the neuroglobin. So I didn't know that one. Uh, it's shifted by one or two residues. So maybe if this beginning of the protein, no, well, but it will throw all of the alignment. So this one doesn't align well because it has an insertion that shifted this position. But this should be a high homology. Maybe it was not identified here just because of the huge difference from a histidine and a glycine. A glycine that is going to be zero side chain versus a histidine that is not only a medium sized side chain, but it's also an, uh, a residue that, depending on the conditions, could have no charge or um, a charge of plus one. So that is, uh, I guess, that's what causes that. Our alignment tree, well, being human, shows that all of the humans are clustered together. And the most different are myoglobin, which is still more similar to hemoglobin, than to neuroglobin. That one is really, really different. Well, really different. 
it has a lot of conservation, but that branch of this tree is the one that is most distant to the others. If you haven't read trees, uh, and I'm trying to ask myself questions that you will ask me, uh, the distances between the origin or the beginning from the left to the right indicate how long ago these proteins might have diverged, okay? So that means then that these two proteins, human hemoglobin gamma 1 and 2, recently separated like in I, I we don't have time here but they were recently divided from one original gene that also gave rise to hemoglobin epsilon these are two more closely related and then they are closely related to epsilon and then there was the branching of beta and delta so beta and delta are more closely related among themselves than to alpha Alpha is related, closely related to Zeta and Theta. Mu is separate. So with these alignments and these trees, you can draw a couple of conclusions about when uh, some genes arose and how old is the relationship and when they split and how different in terms of function they could be. Sometimes, well, in this case, all of this except neuroglobin, because uh, I didn't know that, are secretion proteins. Uh, sorry, no secretion, uh, cytoplasmic proteins. Some of these divergence could come about because of different organelle localization. But now that you know these tools, this is something you could explore with these tools themselves. But I started this uh, session talking about how to use these tools to get into understanding a protein. So because I've been doing hemoglobin a lot and I just realized that there is a protein called neuroglobin, why don't we click on that one? Notice that these codes for the proteins are actually links. So if we click right here, what we get is the specific web page for that protein. It starts remembering us or reminding us that this is the Uniprot knowledge base. There is this code that corresponds to this name. The protein is commonly known as neuroglobin from uh, the gene NGB and the organism is Homo sapiens or human. And this sequence belongs to the review section and it has an annotation score of five. This annotation score is super useful because sometimes, even to review, there's only evidence of proteins at the RNA level or others. And in fact, if you click here, we get this window. This indicates the type of evidence that supports the existence of the protein. Note that the protein existence evidence does not give information on the accuracy or correctness of the sequence display. And if you go to look for more, one, this value of one is a experimental evidence at protein level, which will be actually the maximum, experimental evidence at the transcript level, or RNA, mRNA, e protein inferred from homology, protein predicted, and protein uncertain. So number five is the lowest, number one is the best. If you have a number one, all information is good. Doesn't mean it's perfect, just that it's the best uh, we have in those terms. And as you can see, we have all of these options for display I, and I'm going to cover the column to the left so not do not start reading to the right. We have information for the function, names and taxonomy, subcellular location, pathology and biotech, uh, PTM, post translational modifications pr or processing, expression, interactions, structure, family and domains, sequence, similar proteins, cross references, entry information and miscellaneous. And all of these are uh, checked here because they are present to begin with. Some proteins, even if they are on the reviewed section, may not have information on the expression or similar proteins or structures or interactions. This protein is seemingly very well studied. If we have all this wealth of information, we might as well choose not to have all of it displayed. So you cannot uncheck these sections 
like so. And as you can see, I can I only have this page to scroll and it corresponds to the function. Function involved in oxygen transport in the brain, hexacoordinate globing, which pretty much means it has a heme group, displaying competitive binding of oxygen or the distal histine residue to the iron atom, similarly to what happens in myoglobin and chemoglobin, not capable of penetrating cell membranes. The deoxygenated form exhibit nitric reductase activity inhibiting cellular respiration via non uh, sorry nitrogen oxide binding to cytochrome c oxidase involved in neuroprotection during oxidative, oxidative stress may exert its anti-apoptotic activity by acting to reset the trigger level of mitochondria cytochrome c release necessary to commit the cells to apoptosis. Now that's a very interesting function. I didn't know this. So this is in a way why this base, this database is called knowledge base. It's not just information, but it's information in such a way that with the right knowledge, cellular biology, biochemistry, a little bit of genetics, you can make a lot more out of this. I'm going to turn on everything. This was just an example. Um, I think uh, probably there's a way to turn them on. Oh, yes, all, all at the same time. Yes. If it was turned on like this, I could scroll down through all of the pieces of information. But I'm going to go back and I'm going to do it slowly with you. In in, within functions, we have sites, the histidine responsible for the metal binding. This is the annotation that was used in the sequence alignment. There's uh, the molecular function heme binding, metal ion binding, oxygen binding, oxygen carrier. We kind of expected that due to the similarity to hem hemoglobin and myoglobin. Apoptotic processes and oxygen transport. This is, this is uh, very relevant, I think. I don't know if myoglobin or hemoglobin do participate on this process also, but here again is why knowledge, knowledge matters. If you know a little bit about the cellular biology of hemoglobin, hemoglobin is pretty much a bag of hemoglobin. No nucleus anymore, nor DNA, no, nor any internal organelles. So in hemoglobin, uh, sorry, in red blood cells, hemoglobin cannot participate of that process because there's no cell to apoptosize, so to speak. But then the oxygen transport will be paramount. Uh, there's some databases about the enzyme, enzyme and pathway database and the family. But then we have these two. Here in names and taxonomy, we can see that the Homo sapiens species belongs within the hominidae, catarrhini, aplorini, primates, and so on, all the way to chordata and finally to eukarya and the metazoa kingdom. There's proteomes and organism specific database. Here, one of my favorites sometimes is that subcellular location. And this is something, against, again, I didn't know before, that this neuroglobin is located into the mitochondria. If we were to look at the equivalent for hemoglobin, hemoglobin would be depicted as located in all of the cytoplasm and sometimes extracellularly. Pathology and biotech, uh, there's some interesting things for polymorphism, polymorphisms and mutations. No, I don't know if these are specific for a given biotech, maybe the pharma it is. Post-translational modifications, according to this, the whole sequence becomes the protein. That is, there is no glycosylations or others, or at least not known or identified in this part of the database. There is one disulfide bond. That will be interesting. I don't think hemoglobin or myoglobin have disulfide bonds. I don't remember seeing that uh, as a notation in our alignment. It's I'm, I'm going to go check that. How can I do that? I'm going to go back in my browser. I'm, how, I'm hoping not to break the things I did. Here we go. Here it is. Yeah, as, uh, I didn't know that. Uh, and, and I'm learning, as I hope all of you are, that neuroglobin has a disulfide bond here that is totally, completely absent in all of the other uh, globins of the family, if this are, is a family, which I think they are. They are closely related. Now, I, what I did was open a tab just by right-clicking here, 
so that I don't have to close the alignment and I'm going back here. Yeah, and the mitochondria, that could be redox regulated and there's publications for that, which is pretty cool. Here's there's some links to other databases that also contain uh, information relevant to the post translational modification, but actually it's quite empty because well, I have seen other proteins with more modifications, proteins that get phosphorylated, sumoylated, and ubiquitinylated, and this is kind of empty in that context. Tissue expression, interactions with other proteins. For example, it's known to interact with all of these proteins, and if you click on this, you can get to know which proteins are. In this case, the a pathology is identified, which is actually pretty cool. Here we have protein-protein interactions, which are external databases depicting these, uh, also these interactions. And there's a couple of structures. Look at this. This, I don't think, yeah, looks, it, it's clearly a tetramer as, as hemoglobin is, but looks different. And I don't know exactly why. But we could have this as a topic for the next time we meet. Here we have uh, listed the two entries in the PDB database that contain these structures. This one is a dimer, but probably just because of the unit cell, and this is a tetramer. I'm not sure that, well, as you practice these abilities, uh, working with 3D structures, you, you develop this eye to detect some things, and this oligomer looks kind of asymmetric or, or lacking asymmetry S so I'm expecting not to be fa physiologically relevant this one, this dimer on the other hand kind of looks bigger and symmetric probably I, I'm guessing here, again I'm guessing I have this intuition and I'm guessing that this protein works as a dimer, not as a tetramer but that's something we could find out in through these databases there's only two entries, so we could also visit these four uh, different external databases for structure, uh, family and domains, uh, phylogenies, ex external phylogenies. Here you actually have to click through these guys because you can find all types of different uh, different databases. For example, Imparanoid is ultra interesting because it generates specifically ortholog groups within eukaryotic sequences. So you can find whatever you want here, or whatever you need, rather. Here is the sequence. The status is complete. That is another of these quality uh, uh, measures that you can find, the evidence of the protein, the review, the completeness of the sequence. Here is the length, the mass for just one monomer when this information was last verified and straight from this section you can blast the sequence that is look other sequence that are similar to it or calculate parameters related to the protein for example the molecular mass too but taking into account for example isotopes as you will have to in mass spectrometry the isoelectric point or even experiment on how that the spectro spectrometry results will be with different peptides from this uh, sequence, that is to identify it, to identify it among other sequences or among other proteins, and even peptide uh, generation by proteolysis. So you can predict a couple of these in order, of course, to use these in uh, experimental settings. Given the time, I'm not going to go too deep into that, but maybe next time, since I'm interested in this neuroglobin, I will do that. Uh, sometimes when there's um, different variations in the sequence due to s alternative splicing, those will be listed around here. In this case, uh, only one variant is identified here. That doesn't mean others cannot exist, just that only one is identified here. Here we have a list of similar proteins, which can be expanded. And it's likely to include all other uh, proteins from other species. Yes, you can see chimpanzee, bonobo, and others. 
and in a way it's kind of small other references other sequence databases the same structure over here polymorphism and mutations and finally the entry information when that was integrated into the database this could correspond to the time it was deposited if you will and a miscellaneous uh, section so as you can see this knowledge base is very rich in the information and not only what it's displaying but the sources of the information which i think is all the more important have a reliable source of information for what we are considering to be true to be useful so if you don't mind i think i'm going to stop right here and then uh, we can have another session on next tuesday which will be oh i need to change the calendar which will be the ninth uh, uh unless i have something else exciting to show you before i think i'm gonna go uh, and continue with this slowly gaining momentum and moving to other tools moving to use of several tools at the same time but of course feel free to join in to the stream or if you are watching this delayed on youtube type something in your comments uh, let me know what you think let me know what you want to learn let me know about you and your interest in this channel but for the time being uh, i think that will be all thank you for your time um, please have fun.